Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rosemary Higgins. I'm the director at the American Center. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited about our program today. It's one I've been looking forward to for a while. We're looking at um, anxiety and imposter syndrome, and I think a lot of people can relate to this. I just want to tell you a little bit about the American Center while I have you captive. The American Center is the cultural center for the U.S. Embassy in New Delhi. We host a variety of programs each week. Um, since we're working in the digital space right now, please check us out on our Facebook page that you're linking into now to see about the, the amazing offerings that we have. We have concerts and panel discussions and a variety of topics that we think you'll enjoy. So I'd like to take it over to my friend and colleague, Sanakshi Chowdhury right now from Women in Labor, who can tell you a little bit more about Women in Labor itself and about our amazing panel today. I hope you enjoy the program. Over to you, Sanakshi. Thank you so much, Rose, and thank you everyone for joining us for this live event today. I'm going to give you a quick introduction to Women in Labor, which is a podcast series inspired by the fact that women are dropping out of India's labor force at an alarming rate. Now, anecdotally, it may seem like more women are working. We read stories about women doing exceptional work and scaling new heights. Often, when we bring up the fact that the data says something different, as a team, we've all been getting a lot of surprise looks. Since 2005, the percentage of women in paid work has dropped from 35% to under 24%, and estimates suggest that this declining trend is not abating. In fact, as, one of, as of the 1st of March, the latest World Bank estimates suggest that India's female labor force participation rate is at 20.52%, among the lowest in the world right now. In order to tackle this question of what is going on with women in work in India, Women in Labor was born. Through our journey of unpacking the data on the podcast, we've also had a chance to engage with women's lived experiences through topics that inform this debate, including marriage, motherhood, and education. You can tune into the podcast at www.womeninlabor.com. It's hosted by comedian Aditi Mittal with filmmaker Christina McGillivray, and we've got 17 episodes out already, so go check it out. The podcast is supported by our colleagues over at the, uh, at the American Center, New Delhi. And as Rose mentioned, we've had some wonderful events with the folks over at Wild City. And there's a few great upcoming ones as well. Today marks another such event. I'm not going to take any more of your time and we'll hand over to our amazing moderator for today. Kripi Malvia is an Indian psychologist, experiential uh, psychotherapist, and mental health advocate with a master's in clinical psychology and an international certification in addiction counseling and training. She's worked with adolescents, adults, couples and families with multidisciplinary teams of international mental health professionals from varied cultures and therapeutic backgrounds. She facilitates addiction treatment and general mental health training workshops in South and Southeast Asia. Kripi is an existentially uh, inclined psychotherapist, creative professional and poet who promotes and uh, facilitates the reciprocal connection and relationship between sled expression and psychotherapy with respect, openness and vulnerability. She's also the co-founder of the Poetry Therapy Society of India, the Indian Association of Existential Therapy, and the upcoming Asian Consciousness Collective. Over to you, Kripi. Thank you, Nakshi. And thank you to everyone who is joining us right now. Um, I'm really excited about this, and we're going to be talking to some amazing women today uh, who I'll be introducing in a while. Um, we're going to be unpacking some anxiety and imposter syndrome. And so I was hoping that I could first break these topics down. Um, anxiety is a very, very, you know, well-known uh, condition and something that we all experience at some point in our lives. It can go from uh, being something that drives us to becoming quite debilitating and entering every aspect of our lives. It is basically a feeling of unease and a sense of apprehension and nervousness. Um, it is very tied to a feeling of an uncertain outcome. And there is a preoccupation and a persistent desire inside of ourselves that something is going to happen or we want something to happen. Imposter syndrome, um, which was originally defined in 1978, is basically people feeling that despite their outstanding accomplishments, we feel that we're really not that bright. And we feel that we've fooled anyone who thinks otherwise. It reflects a belief that we're inadequate and that we're incompetent failures, despite having evidence that indicates and suggests that we're skilled and we're successful. So it is basically a psychological phenomena of fraudulent feelings among high achievers. 
a mixture of the anxiety that we spoke about and this persistent inability to recognize our own success, this syndrome can become quite crippling and it can destroy the careers, which is what we were talking about in reflecting how women are dropping off the workforce in India. As something that has affected more women, research suggests that 66% of women have experienced it and only half of that percentage of men experience it. It is perhaps then not surprising that even though it is so prevalent, it is not taken so seriously in the workforce. It also disproportionately affects marginalized identities based on race, sexuality, gender, because the feeling of being a fraud is multiplied in all these identities. The latest research basically shows that there is a sense of emotional exhaustion and the labor that goes into feeling the sense of fraud or feeling the sense of imposter kind of bleeds into every aspect of our life. So it's not only whilst we're working that we experience it, but it goes home with us. And we're trying to constantly balance the sense of wanting to do the best that we can and pushing ourselves very, very hard sometimes to the point of burnout. And also feeling like we want to be real and authentic in all the other roles that we're playing in our lives. Entrepreneurs um, are more likely to experience than other professionals because we're basically personally accountable for our failures. And that makes us feel even more stressed about everything that we put in and everything that we do. I think it goes without saying that this syndrome is a response to a world that doesn't believe in women in general. That we're always feeling and that we will be doubted or seen as weak if we ask for help and if we don't feel like we can do everything on our own. There is a really good research by Dr. Valerie Young, which I thought was really great to, to share with you because it divides the imposter syndrome into subgroups. There is the perfectionist who wants to do everything absolutely right at all times and can be excessively controlling because of that. And it makes it really hard for the perfectionist subgroup of the imposter syndrome to admit that they've made mistakes because that would mean that their worst fear is true, that they're not good at what they do. Then there is the superwoman, the workaholic, who is oftentimes found covering up for their insecurities and looking for external validation for all the work that they're doing. So if they do not receive consistent, persistent validation for the work that they've done, then even one critique or one silence can trigger off a reaction of anxiety. There is the natural genius um, who believe, probably heard that they're good at what they do from the beginning of their lives. And they feel that if they're not able to do the work that they do with the ease and speed, then they're failing. If it doesn't come to them naturally, they're failing. If it takes too much out of them, they feel that they're failing. There is the soloist um, who feels that they need to go solo on everything that they're doing. They can work with people and usually have a lot of people that they collaborate with. But when it comes down to, the, when it comes down to difficult decisions, they feel like they're alone. And it makes it really hard for them to ask for help. And then the last subgroup is the expert. Um, this is when we are trying to be an expert at everything. And even though when we're called an expert, we sort of cringe. Um, and a lot of that comes forth in trying to learn as many skills as possible and constantly trying to learn so that we're not called out on something that we don't know. And it's that feeling of never really knowing enough and never feeling that we know enough. And so the procrastination that sometimes come off, comes off as not being able to finish projects comes because we're learning another course or trying to learn another skill. I will share a small bit of research. According to the Rose Review of Female Entrepreneurship, led by Alison Rowans, the research showed that 28% of working women feel, like, feel that they have an imposter syndrome has stopped them from speaking in a meeting. It also found that 21% have been prevented from suggesting a new or alternative idea at work. And 26% have failed to change their careers or roles for feeling that they will have to start from ground zero. 
75% is the number of professionals who regularly procrastinate as a direct result of the imposter syndrome. It comes from a fear of failing, of empty, and of humiliating ourselves. But ultimately, it is driven by a desire to be perfect. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from the stories of how the women that I'm joined with today have set, ha have set really, really high expectations of themselves and can feel that it is impossible to live up to these standards. So on that note, I'm very, very pleased to welcome my panelists. We're joined by, firstly, an award-winning business news presenter, editor of She the People and She the People TV founder, Shirley Chopra, which is India's biggest platform for real women and real stories. She is an award-winning journalist turned entrepreneur. She is putting her television experience into a solid platform and experimenting with new age media to find solutions to problems that women face with grit and valor. Secondly, we're joined by project director of Sangat and Patty Gonzalez. Patty works in the areas of public engagement and digital intervention to improve adolescent and youth mental health through powerful and award-winning campaigns focusing on large scale and grassroots research, awareness and intervention strategies. And finally, I'm really happy to welcome the Director of Market Development at CD Baby and founder of MGMH, Ritne Ganayan. Throughout her 19 years of experience in the music industry, she has worked with many noteworthy national and international artists, and she consults at many festivals. She has been sharing, and I'm sure she will continue to share her expertise through her writing, through the courses that she has started and through hosting artist community healing circles. So thank you to all of you. Now I'm going to pose a few questions that I've put together. Um, and this, since this is on Zoom, I'm going to try and focus on each one of you. I don't want to repeat the same question, although it would, it would be great if one of you feels that you would like to answer that question. But I'll, so that we don't crisscross, I'll go through each one's name. So the first thing that I wanted to just put out there is wanting to understand, you know, just to take a few minutes from uh, one by one to, to share with all of us how you experience this syndrome and this anxiety. Like, what is the kind of language that you have in your mind or you've had in your mind when you are doubting or dismissing the work that you do? So let's start with Shelly. Great, thanks very much. It's, um, it's a pleasure being here. And I think uh, most importantly, we're having very meaningful discussions and I hope that they can be a pointer for those who are, who are often stuck like many of us are and could find the better of themselves by knowing that a lot of us go through this. They needn't go through it if they could pick some lessons from what we went through. Um, so I'm a journalist, I spent 20 years on television and then I decided to come up with a platform for women. Uh, you can imagine the kind of questions I was put through, uh, you know, aside of the fact that why should women need a platform of their own? Uh, and uh, it took me a while to come up with some answers uh, for, for those who were very quick to judge uh, and conclude that uh, women possibly consume information, news, content, um, anything. Uh, just like men do. Uh, and I think the imposter syndrome in that sense um, has sort of lived uh, and, and sort of flourished um, and bred further uh, throughout my career because I happened to sort of tread my career at a time when, uh, when women were not talking out, uh, we, we were not speaking up enough for each other. Uh, most importantly, we were in awe of uh, men being achievers, I never thought we could get there. Um, so as, as a journalist who mostly covered the stock market and business world, uh, seeing men around me was absolutely normal. If I saw women who were leading companies, it would be a special day. Uh, so for, you know, uh, so if I look at just the inspiration around, right, uh, it, it came from the notion that in order to be somebody who has a cabin or uh, is an editor or is taking financial or editorial uh, decisions, you have to end up going and meeting a man. And this is what uh, remained uh, in, you know, with me through the course of my uh, career. Uh, and I did face uh, you know, very, very uh, complex moments when I was wondering, should I report this? 
But if I report it, then who do I report it to? For example, one of the most stark memories of my journalism career is being really young and very senior in my work. So when I was in my 20s, I was, I was at a position where the organization said, I will have to create a new place for you to rise because you're already on the top, right? And this basically meant that some guy had to move. And very often I would have to uh, face um, water cooler conversations where somebody would turn around and say, you know, women are great for television as long as they're not coming up and taking the role of deciding uh, things in the cabin of an editor or is uh, essentially deciding the business of where media is going. So for me, uh, this, this comment that you're never going to be managing editor uh, or managing director sorry, not editor, managing director, was one of those things that uh, stuck, you know, sort of stuck for me forever. That, uh, you know, what was this, right? Uh, and when you're young, you're growing, you, you're only wanting to latch on to stuff that makes you propel forward, question your, um, your you know, your ability to do even better. I mean, question it in a positive way and push yourself to do more and find that sisterhood. But I think when you are not, um, when you're not raised in an environment, and by that is not my family upbringing, but just being raised in an environment like ours, right? Like, like for most women born in the 80s, our millennials are stuck between this massive hungry ambition, but uh, just do not have either support uh, within the sisterhood or support professionally. And also to an extent, have generational gaps with parents. Where do they go, right? Mm -hmm. You are, you are constantly living in a pool of um, family ties that celebrate the notion that you should give up uh, your ambitions to be a, a person who wants to, let's say, lead a manufacturing company and become an air hostess. Now, there's nothing wrong with being an air hostess, but I don't see the reason why I should be deterred from leading a manufacturing company because these are roles not cut out for me. So I think for me, the whole imposter syndrome sort of came alive the day I turned 18 and left my house to meet women and men in the real world who constantly reminded me that you want to be a journalist, decide to be a feature journalist, write about books, write about fashion and parties. And to me, you know, I, I don't consider any of these beats any less important. But just because I chose to be an economics honors graduate, go pick up stock markets, suddenly all of that was stuff that made me double question myself. Mm -hmm. And it was only when I decided to launch She The People that I recognized my, my fight within and my fight with the world about wanting to get rid of this for myself and others who were waiting to launch themselves. And uh, which is why I felt that when I stepped out to set out uh, She The People, 89% of the people I met said, why do women, a niche a lot of people need a platform to talk for them. So, you know, it was almost my asking them and, you know, it took me a struggle because sometimes you think you're supremely confident and then you land up in this startup life asking yourself, hey, you know, I'm starting out. So I've got to really be humble. I can't really be bold. I can't say stuff that could antagonize others. Yeah. But there was no other way. I had to go find numbers to convince the world that I was doing this because I had an absolute valid, uh, recognized, well-researched reason. 20% of your country is female. Indian women make for 10% of the global population. And we get under 1% of media space in our own country. So I think I have um, tried to find my voice, uh, but not without an enormous, an enormous amount of struggle. Thank you, sir. That was really, you did lay out so much on the questions as well. So, you know, like, I would like to get, um, um, it's just really good to hear because you talked about the main aspects that impact. And I'm sure um, that Ian, I think I will agree, there is that male dominated space that is uh, uh, coupled with being young and a woman wanting to prove ourselves. And then knowing that the roles, when you finally make it, are not designed for you anyway. And so in some, some sense, it feels like the platform that you created was to counter the imposter syndrome and to create that uh, loop where every time you doubted yourself, you created a platform where women could move forward with their voices. So thank you for sharing that. Patty, 
would love to hear your version of like what are the ways in which you know this this doubt what is your language of doubt and how do you feel you know what are the factors in your experience in your industry in the way in where you work how it contributes to this phenomena from a social cultural point of view thank you Krippi. and also thank you american center and wild city for having this discussion um, it was really good to hear uh, Shelley's point of view. I think my experience was a bit more sort of internal rather than external where um, I don't think I would have called it imposter syndrome till fairly recently. I wasn't even familiar with the term, to be honest, till a couple of years ago. And when I read about it, I was like, hmm, you know, this makes sense. Uh, I have experienced a range of these different um, sort of parts of it. And mine had, a, I guess, a very funny manifestation, which was uh, that when I was sort of starting out on my career or a few years in, I would say, um, I was completely unable to answer the question when someone would ask me what I do. I would just basically freeze up. Uh, my mind would just go blank. And I, I mean, I knew what I did, um, but I was unable to express it. And this lasted actually quite a long time, a few years. And people would always say, oh, you know, you've done all this stuff. And like, you studied these things, like, you know, and you're doing X, Y, Z. Um, but it, it, it just it couldn't come from me. And I think it stemmed from this part of me that also was thinking, you know, uh, you're not good enough, or you don't know enough, or, you know, how can you answer questions about something that is so big and challenging and important? Uh, and it's a topic that, you know, so many other experts uh, know more about. Um, and also working in that space of, you know, mental health and, and I work more in global mental health. So it's lots of, you know, big challenges, most of which are essentially out of my control. Um, and you're seeing these things that, you know, you want to work on, but you're not sure what change you're going to make or what impact uh, you can have. I think all of that sort of compounded um, leads you to believe or leads you to think, you know, like, how am I going to su succeed at this task? And sometimes you're not even sure what the task really is. Um, so I think in terms of the social cultural also, it's definitely around, um, I think for me, it was this idea of, you know, su succeeding a certain way and not failing a certain way. Uh, and I think a lot of these notions were, you know, ideas that I had, um, which obviously had been fed in from, you know, larger cultural understanding of this. And also from, I think I share the sentiment of, you know, academia as well as, um, more recently, I work in technology. They're both quite male-dominated spaces. And if you're a young woman, it really generally and genuinely is difficult to, well, quote-unquote, establish yourself mm -hmm. there. And one of the incidents I think that was quite pivotal for me was um, a few years ago having to speak and sort of I had to do something with somebody who was a much, much older man. And I remember sort of basically pretending to be a lot less smart um, and receiving for for me what was very pivotal advice from my boss at the time who said you know you absolutely should never ever ever do that and don't compromise on who you are um and you should speak your mind and i think that was something that really stuck with me and i think was definitely a sort of changing uh, point when i you know felt that validation or felt that encouragement from somewhere else and it was such a simple small thing that somebody encouraged you who was also then in a position of you know authority or power and so on so I think that was helpful. But yeah, it was definitely, it was a combination of, I think, a lot of these ideas that we live with and often, you know, don't know how to navigate. And you're searching for these different avenues to, to navigate them. So my struggle was really, I think, internal. And as I said, it manifested in a very funny way now. But at the time, it was obviously quite distressing because I was like, oh, if I can't see it, then I must not know it. And that must not mean that I'm doing something worthwhile, et cetera, et cetera. And you know how an anxious thought will just move into more anxious thoughts so yeah i'll stop there but that was what it was like no that's really it's uh, that's really interesting because you kind of bring it to one of the biggest issues with this is that we feel that it's only happening to us so how could we even know that there is something wrong with it and uh, the double bind that i feel in imposter syndrome is that you're trying already to not feel like an imposter so it's really hard to then go to someone and be like I think I don't know what I'm doing because that would just validate that feeling even more. So this is why this, you know, knowing, having all these viewers hopefully know that if they're feeling doubting themselves is something that is felt by people and women on all, 
levels of expertise, no matter how high they reach from my Angelo to Tina Fey. Um, always feeling something is, you know, that, that they, don't, they don't deserve it. It must have been a mistake. Um, and the other thing that I think you're also mentioning is that um, if you look at the social cultural worldview of patriarchy and that we're in a male dominated society, then men also attempt new things, you know, all of you know, they attempt new, uh, you know, avenues and new initiatives, but somehow because they're not hardwired to believe, I think that's what he was saying, to believe that who are they to run into this, who are they to go into this, um, they feel much more confident sometimes overconfident in their ability. And here we are sitting and thinking, hmm, do I really know if I know how to do this? So I think this is really, really powerful. And the last thing that I think is really important in what you've mentioned is the underplaying, first of all, not believing any of the accolades, uh, even though we write it in our bios, but not being able to actually internalize that we have done so and everybody trying to rationally tell us to look what you've done, but look what you've done, but it kind of not going, it's like, yes, yes, of course and you know, kind of dismissing it. Um, and I think it flares up the most around the perceived, you know, uh, as Shelley said, the perceived people who run the world when they're around older men uh, who, who, you know, who take authority of what they're doing is like, you see, you find yourself shrinking so that you don't cause a conflict and don't step their ego. So I think this is a really good start. Thank you for that. I think, uh, Please share your understanding. What has it been like for you in your world, internal and external, to feel uh, like you don't belong? <laughs> thanks, Krippi, for having me. And thanks, American Center, Wild City, and Women in Labor for, for doing this. This is great. Um, so I basically work in music. And when I you know, first came back to India in 2007, and I tried to you know, either start my own company or basically get a job in music, one of the the, you know, one of the biggest things was there were no women in the music industry at that time. I mean, there were a few, maybe two, three, and they worked for people. So when I started my company, I'm pretty sure I was the only one doing it, you know, on, on their own. So it was definitely uh, quite, um, quite a new, you know, a new way to kind of start off. I had come into a new place where, which, where I had been away for so long. Um, and then, you know, all my childhood stuff kind of started coming back. So I do have a history of bipolar. I do have a history and family history of depression and anxiety has always been a part of it, you know? Um, and up till I'm going to say about a couple of years ago, I didn't really know how to deal with it, to be honest, you know? Um, and it does come up, uh, you know, I've had, um, first thing is I do festival production, you know, which is setting up large scale festivals. And the first thing is that's a man's job. Women don't do that, you know? I, I remember very distinctly a friend of mine telling me who was a model that that was a man's job. And I'm like, so a woman's job is what? Just being half naked on a cover? Like, you know, what does that mean? Um, yeah. And then it was always, you know, um, I had to always kind of prove that I knew what I was talking about. And luckily because I had the, the educational background because I have a master's in music business, a lot of other people in the industry couldn't kind of um, attack me on the knowledge. So they would attack me on the fact that I was a woman, you know, and that I would use my feminine wiles to get the job done, which was completely not true. You know, I didn't even know I had feminine wiles, but it was just, you know, the stuff that would, you know, that would make you feel, you know, that, okay, so you have nothing to say about what I'm talking about, the business of side of things. So that's what you're going to attack. And it, you know, even when I wrote my book, I mean, I interviewed a lot of people for each chapter because a part of me was like, who am I to give people information about the industry? Even though I've been in it for, you know, in this business for like at that time, like 10 years. So I was just like, okay, maybe I'll get everybody's interviews. So it's just on me talking is everyone talking, you know? So people wouldn't be like, oh, who is she? They're like, oh, she's got everybody's point of view. You know, so it does definitely come up. And I think the best, the only way I've been able to kind of get so far before I got the, you know, the tools to cope with it was not to think of myself as a woman. I never say, oh, I'm a woman in the business. I say I'm the best, I'm a, a music person. You know, I am, I am a person who works in this industry. It's not about me being a woman. Mm -hmm. I don't actually go from the woman's point of view. You know what I mean? I just like, am I the best person for this job? Great. You know, it doesn't matter if I'm a woman or a man. And that's pretty much how I kind of go about it. Okay. Thank you for that. 
Um, I was just, I'm just writing down some of the things that you said, because we will circle back, you know, this is a really good introduction, we will circle back at some of the things that you said, and, and the next few questions will be a little bit more specific to how certain things impact you, but I think, again, really, uh, really powerful points of, um, thank you for sharing that you've had experiences of already struggling, and that you can see that when you're doing this, it obviously, it's like, other pre-existing conditions or circumstances then flare up and then catch you off guard and enter into the space where you're already feeling like you you know that you don't belong another thing um that i should have mentioned but you have now is this when women do do well uh, then they're accused of what is called positive discrimination which is what you're pointing out is you're doing well because you're a woman you're doing well because the eyes are on you you're doing well because now uh, we are creating spaces for women to do so. And if you want a woman, so in, so the gaslighting here that happens is that your the, the discrimination that you're facing, you should be grateful for it, um, which is really, really, you know, toxic to say the least. And another thing that you mentioned, you know, which is what we talked about, the subgroups, right? And you could, as you three are sharing, you can see the subgroups of the imposter syndrome, including where I belong in them, um, of, you know, making ourselves uncriticable by doing the courses, for example, knowing, you know, that, that this is something you can't question me on and, and bringing ourselves to such, such a level of expertise. And we know we're probably learning, training, doing way more than other people that we have to work with, but we don't want to give them something to critique us on. Um, what is very real in what you said, uh, but also saddening is that a lot of women over the generations and, you know, talking about feminism, women who have predated us, a lot of women had to abandon their identities as women, like you said, had to go like, I'm not even gonna, I'm just gonna act like I'm not it in order to make it, in order to not feel like they had to justify, because somehow feeling the sense of pride for the identity of a woman was not synonymous was succeeding and so we're like no nope, i'm not a woman just a person see me as a person so yeah that's that's really really powerful my questions were so what i can share and i'll start with this is the question that i'd ask myself is the questions that i was posing to you is, for example what areas of your life you know does this seep into uh, is this sense of self something that follows you home or in relationships so why I said that was because one of the ways in which I could identify this was that this sense of wanting to do everything as perfectly as possible and wanting to overdo, overdo myself and never leave any room for doubt or criticism also entered into all other aspects of my life. So it was like, I cannot fail in this relationship. I cannot fail in this collaboration. I cannot fail. So um, again, Shelley, is there something that comes to mind, an anecdote or something or a story or something wherein you can see yourself becoming this person who's doubting at the same time, but also creating a huge wall and, uh, you know, feeling like you can't be critiqued in your life, personal life. Yeah, so I think, you know, this is something that happens uh, routinely uh, when you meet the woman in the mirror. Uh, and, and this happens at every important, nervous, new juncture uh, that anyone, uh, especially uh, women, but now as I hear from a lot of the transgender community as well, a lot of us have very similar challenges. Uh, I think the times that I have always felt a bit, um, uh, I would say, uncertain, uh, vulnerable, is uh, when I have had to deal with powerful women, uh, men and, and notice how uh, their tools for displaying power are so different from how uh, women display power. You know, um, there is uh, something that you alluded to earlier, which is more or less about how when men do certain things, they are applauded for it. And when women do the same things, uh, they are told that they are, um, you know, that they're not good enough. And they're probably penalized for this. I'll give you an example in across industry today, whichever corporate media sector you want to take, media or non-media sector is that when a woman seeks her right to speak up on anything, and it's not even about a personal issue or a feminist issue, it's an issue about, let's say, something that's very functional, let's say the weather or whether domestic flights should resume in India or not uh, in, in, in the COVID crisis. You know, um, an opinionated woman who has a view that differs from the rest of the lot will be categorized as, 
either uh, an aggressive person and to be just as blunt as they are mostly or what a bitch. You know, this is really uh, the way people approach women in most setups. Conference rooms after conference rooms, I have um, I've sat in editor uh, edit meetings, but even outside my own sector, I have seen how top CEOs of many companies around the world treat women when they're in a conference hall, when I am a media observer, for example. And I noticed that this is par for the course because it is acceptable by the larger audience in that community, which is male in the corporate sector, to do this. So essentially there is no resistance plus this validation of what people are saying. And there is a sense that, okay, to begin with, majority wins, right? So that's a standard rule of thumb from, from, from the Stone Age, I think, right? So I think that permanently goes in favor of uh, men. The other thing is in many spaces, when women don't find enough allies, they eventually give up the fight, right? Uh, or they choose to give up the job or give up, give up being that force for the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think somewhere where uh, these things emerge really, really uncomfortably is when women become mothers. Uh, and that's when they are expected both by men and women in, in the gender milieu of things to give up their feminism. Suddenly they are uh, expected to be okay with the superwoman syndrome that they were so far uh, speaking up against. Uh, they are penalized for trying to multitask because they may not have a choice, but they would be penalized for it. They would be told that there, um, there is an inefficiency creeping into their work because they have way too much on their plate. You know, that way too much on their plate is an excuse to take away things from your plate that you don't want to give up. Right. So I think there is this constant um, pressure point that emerges. Um, and I think I've gone through each one of them, whether it was from the young to a senior person trying to find her way to, to sort of, you know, mellow down in the eyes of the world because now I was senior enough and I should be seen building teams and not questioning them. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can already hear the various double quotes in my voice. Or when I decided to become a mother and chose to have a startup and people said that maybe you left because you wanted to have a baby, but I did not because I left three years before I decided to have a baby. So I think there are so many things that are constantly on your head that you're trying to battle perceptions of that your biggest fight when you feel vulnerable is that this is the force I want to be, but everything is pulling me. And I'm getting distracted with things I don't want to get distracted by, but I have no choice. So like any, any efficient machine, if you're going to be pulled down in different ways, sometimes you start thinking, okay, I'm done. I'm spent. Yeah. Are you there with me? Yeah. You're back. Yeah. Thank you for that. Can you hear me still? Yes, oh, yes, good. we can hear you now. You're brilliant. Phew. What pressure. Okay, so that's really that's really amazing because that you're actually going into the thing now, which is what was, you know, um, where does it come from and what are all the other areas in which the pressure is there? Because as we know, this is not born out of, you know, thin air. It's not just this regular feeling of feeling that we're not doing enough. It is this fight of also, and talking about the workplace thing is that, you know, we may have the privileges that we're sitting here today of being able to push through to some of the things that we wanted to do. Maybe had supportive family members or supportive or had some resources. So we were able to push through but we also know that the pressure still exists on what is it that is expected of us and what is it that we've internalized is expected of us and i think that's something that you've highlighted really well is that that balancing act never quite ends and it just you know it brings brings me to think about how much labor emotional exhaustive labor do we normalize on a regular basis when we're coping with this is that that's just how it is we're supposed to just feel this stress that's how it is. It's like we accept the stress, accept the stress of being berated, accept the stress of being belittled, um, and accept the stress of always having to have a best face forward when justifying all of our choices, including to ourselves and, and sometimes our most intimate relationships as well. Um, so you're, I mean, the motherhood thing is huge because then you have the home and you have 
the workplace where you're trying to do stuff, then you have your partner and probably other extended family relationships um, where you can, any one mistake, perceived mistake feels like a question mark on everything. So thank you for sharing that. So I'm gonna go through the same thing. Patty, what do you feel are some of the things that you know follows you home or in relationships or what you felt was the foundational factors of, of, of this, you know, when you find yourself um, trying to justify or be the best version of yourself in front of where you're supposed to feel safe, even there wanting to not feel, see, be seen as weak or vulnerable. Thanks. Um, I mean, I have a sort of short answer and I'll maybe try and like uh, state the obvious first, which is that I think any of these kinds of stresses will impact multiple domains of your life because it's very difficult for it to, to not do that. Um, and this could be, again, like starting from the internal, so your sense of self and your sense of confidence. Uh, and I think without a doubt, relationships, particularly close ones, because we tend to take out or express a lot of our frustration there. And then I think also things like making decisions, you know, will you opt for an opportunity or do something or, you know, is that anxiety or fear uh, getting in the way of you doing something? And then I think most importantly and profoundly on your sense of mental health uh, and this could manifest, you know, whether it's in terms of just a lot of fatigue or burnout, um, et cetera. So I, I do think it's impossible for for these kinds of feelings uh, to not impact those multiple domains if you don't um, address them. And I think I get, I'll just sort of, sort of have a short answer, which is to say that I think the, the thing that really helped me was to, and it took time to learn this and understand this, but the idea that you are um, or thinking that this idea of, you know, you are what you do versus what you do is just part of who you are. And I think, especially in relation to work, since that's what we're discussing, but it took me, I think, a long time to realize that. And because also we tend to justify our, you know, our worth, et cetera, through the things we do. And I think making that realization, it's still very hard. I don't always practice it very well. But, you know, constantly reminding myself that I am much more than the work that I do. Um, and the work that I do enhances who I am. It makes me, it's part of who I am, but it isn't everything and it doesn't define me completely. So I think that is something that over time has really helped. Um, it, again, needless to say, is an ongoing um, sort of struggle sometimes to keep reminding yourself and believe that. But I think these would be two things. One is to say, you know, it does impact your whole life and it, and it will. And the second being, you know, what can you do about it? And this reframing really helped me a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so this is because, you know, this is about that, you talked about that, you know not knowing that other people feel that way and then that process of realizing it's not just you um but one of the uh so you know the question that you answered was was how do you push through this you know first is that unflinching recognition i guess is really required and i think it takes courage to do that um without feeling like you know that you're falling apart and without feeling like um all your worst fears will be validated once people do see a struggle of that recognition. It is impacting me. I am act, I am probably on the brink of burnout. I am probably working way too much. I am probably feeling like, and I, that distinction that you made is really, really uh, beautiful in the sense that, you know, not making it all about the work because initially one of the ways to cope with imposter syndrome is to work like hell and not be able to, uh, see our worth in any other way and run, and sort of see all the other things sort of just become, you know, like further off branches of the main core, which becomes work. And it's that feel, every time feeling like, every time we get like a trigger of the same imposter syndrome or anxiety, then we put in hundred times more work till we realize and can, ha I think it happens to everyone who experiences this at some point is that now you you realize you are, can't, you're inseparable from your work. And if you can't imagine what it would be like, um, who you would be if you were not that work that you had been creating. And then I think one of the best ways of healing actually is to be able to step, take a step back and, and find a worth without having it constantly come through work. Um, so yeah, I think that's a very, very valid point. And, and something, that, something that I think about a, a lot as well. Um, and I've had to do 
for me to just to be like okay now that i've established this i cannot use my anxiety as a way to push myself and other people that depend on me to the point of burnout so thank you for that Nitnika, what about you where do you see this creeping up in every day how do you push through this where have you found yourself like lost in this and then push yourself pull yourself back i think for me it's a very uh, different way i think for me of the feeling of not being good enough has kind of stayed with me even before work so this was you know this kind of started for me when i was much younger I, even though i didn't know how to put words to it and it was just something that uh, you know i kind of the last couple of years is something that i you know because i became a life coach and i got into eft and things i was able to identify that these were all things from childhood that i hadn't healed from that i hadn't truly addressed you know and they would come back and uh, they would come back in relationships with my family they would come back you know it would get reinforced by the kind of people i would date and the you know and you know and stuff in my family because i hadn't healed my you know deep wounds you know yeah. and this is something i've only come to understand recently you know it's not something you know beforehand and it would just you know it comes up uh, you know for me my work actually gave me the validation that i think i wanted from everywhere else you know if especially the kind of work i do you know in music in india is like oh you have a good hobby you know i'm just like this is not a hobby i i pay for everything you know but it's it not just, i you know not my parents cuz i'm very lucky to be you know from you know my my both my parents work together so i'm very lucky to have that but extended family and things like that you know i get a lot of like oh we have, you know we have to take care of the household it is so much work and i'm like so do i and i work so what's the big deal you know mm -hmm. so there's a lot of that oh you're doing work cuz you know what you're doing music it's so you know so quaint so sweet you got a little hobby and all of that is like you're trying to kind of find that validation but you don't get it mm -hmm. so i kind of hence you know try to get it from work but then because the issues are still there say tomorrow i lose you know i was artist doing artist management and i say i ended management with a with a band it was uh it was like a big loss to me you know because for me it was like oh my god like it was like losing a partner you know it was like losing a boyfriend because for me it was so personal so my work is very personal to me which is why i always say i work with people who i get a good vibe from because for me my work is me and it's my safe space you know and it's the only way where i can kind of get the kind of validation i want even though i don't get it sometimes you know but it's actually you know the other way around for me i guess i don't know yeah i don't i mean it's actually not it's it's actually not against anything that that anybody has said in fact what you're talking about is that recognition that if this is work is where you invested in so you were able to see i'm putting this in so i need to get this back this is where i'll be validated for who i am and realizing that that coping strategy can sometimes need another coping strategy you know it's like i've now got it now what do i do um and it's like if you look at relationships right when we we know that if we have all these expectations from any interpersonal relationship like you mentioned it's it's spot on is that work and self is also a huge relationship it is like any other significant really important relationship so we know when we are in a relationship uh with a partner that if we expect them to validate every single element of what we're doing and if our sense of worth is tied up to them feeling thankful or them feeling grateful or them feeling like you know patting us and saying we've done a good job after a while we realize we don't have it within ourselves so we have to build it internally um and i think that's that's really valuable another thing that i feel that you've really hit the nail on the head with is which is what the next question was about is that you know this the struggles that we go through to to prove ourselves make us hardened for you know give give this resilience and and it it we realize that these are some of the things we just have to face and over time we also can sometimes feel like you know when other people start just starting off and they are complaining about or saying things that you know they can't do this or they can't do that and you're like yeah i know but you know there is so much more so much more work that we need to get done like you know you will move through this so it can sometimes also 
it can also sometimes seep into i know i've done this and i need you to pull yourself up from your bootstraps which is exactly what was expected of us it becomes a cycle in the beginning you know we feel it we should fix it ourselves and not demand systemic change um so no i think that's that is it. that is brilliant there's i think i'm i'm definitely keeping time which is new for me and so one of the last questions that i wanted to ask yourself is that there is there is a cost that is associated with having imposter syndrome and not working through it and that harm is to the self and to everyone that we work with and so the question was you know how do you feel that not healing through this syndrome not healing through these feelings can cause harm to yourself and other people and what that means is one of the examples i will give is that one of the ways of coping with self doubt is by an egomania state which is that sometimes we occupy this space where we feel we can do everything all the time and that can get in the way of us developing you know healthy long term consistent collaborative equitable relationships so there is costs so i just wanted to hear from you again shall if you could start with what did you how do you feel that if you don't heal in whatever form from this is the harm you're causing to your own self to your industry and to your relationships okay so i have to say um without sounding like i've tried to crack this but in that sense i have i have never really felt over confidence or egoistic or somebody who feels that things are getting into my head because there are so many unfortunate corrective measures around that even if one wants to sound like or that one is finally on top of the game that uh you know some of this has uh, fallen off the wayside so i think for me the battle has never really reached the point where things are are uh, going to get to my head um i think the place they really are today is a um, constant reminder that in order for one to become some form of an achiever and by that i don't mean like the traditional definitions of faces on magazines and so on and so forth i really mean like somebody who's content with where she's getting or going and the impact she wants to have on her life and others so when i look at some of that i feel that there is this missing the train hurry which i would like to slow uh this constant feeling that if i don't do this somebody else is going to come and do it okay and that to me is a larger you know mental health or or just soul searching space yeah and if i don't kind of find a pause to say that i want to do this and i am going to try and achieve it to the extent that i can Mm-hmm. and not bother about whether i have reached the cliff or whatever else comes i think that would be okay but i also sometimes give myself i cut myself slack on the fact that today we in the last 15 years and maybe i'm being generous with the time period have actually given women the space to run the race that they've always wanted to mm-hmm. and as a result of which i feel and find myself breathless like many other everyday women wanting to not let this go and it is it is stressful it comes with a pack of expectations that we lay down for ourselves and then others lay off you mm-hmm. uh, i think there are very you know sort of interesting examples today even in the indian context we had bankers women bankers who made it to the top were almost untouchable by the possibilities of you know who can truly get there and then they fell and when they fell there was this round of applause that still echoes in my head because there are people i think a large number of men and a few women who recognized that guess what it had to give somewhere you know you're you're in that that situation that's that's you're like that's doing if you don't you don't yourself, you don't out, yourself there, out there uh then, uh, how, then do you, how, how do you how do you come to terms with this notion that listen i might end up falling off that race that i've for so many years wanted to be part of and if i do then there'll be somebody lurking out there saying oh she's burnt out or that she committed a mistake or like in the case of the bankers a legit mistake that they made and they are under investigation but they become the sole example for every woman wanting to lead in the banking industry now 
so i feel that you know um that is where uh for me is my bigger mental health crisis yeah. to, to come to terms with the with the need to sometimes be okay not in that race but also this this opportunity i just feel i won't let go <laughs> yeah no that's very very astutely put something that i can really resonate with as well patty what do you feel about what what is the harm that can come for you if you know that the harm that we carry that we're capable of creating if we don't address this yeah i think just following on from from my last comment as well i think i mean that harm is obviously to yourself uh, but also to the people around you uh, whether that's your family and colleagues and again i think if you make this a little bit more contextual to the workplace and and career and and sort of jobs and so on i think to say that you know everybody has these moments of doubt uh, and to to sort of remember that that's very normal mm-hmm. um but i think the important part is to not let that doubt control your actions mm-hmm. uh, so i think you know the the long term goal is not to never feel like an imposter it's to just not feel like an imposter all the time and to be okay with having you know the odd imposter moment um mm-hmm. because that will i think profoundly impact the people that you work with the way that you work with them you know the kind of encouragement that you can give other people and so on if you don't believe i mean this it might sound a bit cliche to say this but if you don't have a certain amount of faith and belief in in yourself and your sense of self worth is very hard to convince somebody else so and i think people really pick up on that energy and that um you know the sort of what you bring into a space of work and into a space of collaboration and so on and if you're tired if you're edgy um there's no nice way to say this everybody will sense it everybody feels it um mm-hmm. and it it really takes a toll on if you're you know trying to work on something together uh, or with other people you want to be able to bring you know the best version of yourself so you want to do whatever you can to be that best version of yourself so yeah, yeah. absolutely and allow allow for space allow for the space for the other person to enter into it too um and not let it overshadow it. um you know not go into complex about it i think that's really really powerful as well thank you for that um we're going to right after ritnika you were going to go into the q and a's so we'd love to get your thoughts about how how you feel that you could have edged on the harmful to yourself and other people when you were trying to cope with this i think uh, for me it's always been because my job has been part of my identity it's been tough when i wanted to make a change when uh, i mean i still have my own company but i i changed from artist management and then i got the cd baby job so i do both but it was always like oh my god if i am my company if i am mgmh and i am an artist manager if i stop doing that aspect of my business then who am i you know and that was a big thing for me to kind of come uh, you know to kind of work through and what really helped me was a lot of eft you know emotional freedom technique i'm a big believer of that because for me it was a lot of you know working on myself and asking the real question what is this really about you know yeah. is it really about this or what is the core you know the core belief a core limiting belief as you know what you say but for me now what i've started to understand is what i really want to do in life is to help people to make a difference and in whatever way i can as long as you know so i think just reminding myself that that is why i'm here is to yeah. be, you know look at your bigger goal rather than be like okay i should do it through this way or through that way i can do it through any way but what do, what is my main purpose of being alive right now is to make a difference is to contribute and help and i try to do whatever i can and that is me reminding myself that this is why you're doing it yeah and thank you and thank you thank you for that that's that's with my questions i'm sure we're going to like have a lot of questions so uh what, what i will do is i will just read them read them out there probably two per uh, this is from the audience and see whichever one you would like to answer and you know we have about 50 we have 15 minutes 20 minutes 15 minutes to answer these questions so for shelly how can we change journalism education so that it empowers more aspiring female journalists instead of leaving them feeling like they're boxed into certain beats and what helped you identify and own your strengths and weaknesses and how did you apply this to your career so these are the questions for you shelly okay great so i think i'll answer the first question um this way that you know uh, the only way one can do it 
is to raise one's hand and say that they want to go for the other beat. Uh, it's very easy for um, many around us to make assumptions that just because you're a girl, you shouldn't end up at the border, just because you're a girl that you shouldn't be re uh, reporting in the middle of the night. I think there are a couple of good examples of women who try to do this, no matter what kind of field. I've spent many, many days, even to chase corporate deals, to sit outside an airport or sit outside a hotel behind the bush, just waiting to catch the CEO and ask him a question. So I think raising your hand, going up to your editor and literally spelling it out the way you feel. Uh, there is going to be no recipe. Uh, we've got age old ideas stuck in the heads of age old editors who should, be have, uh, who should have been retired some time ago, if you ask me. So I really think there is an opportunity for you to have to just make that conversation happen. Sometimes we're too shy. We're too scared and we're too intimidated to have those conversations. I would only suggest that no matter how young you are and how, how shy you are, just muster your courage to do that first, okay? And no doubt the beats need to change. More importantly, the idea of women doing a lot of other beats needs to become more widespread and accepted uh, because there's nothing wrong with any beat, but they shouldn't be boxed at all. Uh, so far as my strengths and weaknesses go, I think one of the strengths that I've had uh, and this is very media centric. I haven't been obsessed with seeing my face on television. Uh, and I think that's allowed me to make myself um, indispensable. Um, I mean, sorry, dispensable in my own eyes, uh, even though I would like the world to have an impression that I'm indispensable for the job that I do. Uh, and that's really been coming to terms with starting up again and again. I, I left CNBC at a point where uh, people asked me who leaves that uh, sort of an organization. I did exactly that with NDTV and whatever else followed. So I was with the biggest brands, but I quit them when I was feeling good about where I was in life. I did not leave places when I was bogged down and sad. So I think that's been my biggest strength that I leave when I feel good because I feel when I feel good is when I can start something new. Um, I think in terms of my weakness, I think, you know, um, we as women generally come with a lot of baggage, which we, which we don't mind putting out on full display. I think sometimes it's great to do that. But sometimes, you know what, I think people just use that against you. So I feel that um, one should pick and choose the baggage and the situation to talk about it. So I would say my weakness is sometimes I try to deal with the environment around me with a little bit of manipulation on that baggage because learn the hard way, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot for that. So, Patty, um, and please ask me to repeat the questions if you want to go back to them because you know, if you had done this to me, I would have asked you to do that. Mm -hmm. um, what do you wish you knew uh, with regard to anxiety and imposter syndrome at the start of your professional career? Is the first question. And second is, what are some of the ways in which uh, we can begin speaking more about emotional labor to normalize this conversation? Oh, great, great questions. Uh, so the first one, which is, what do I wish that I knew? Uh, so it's, I would say it's really, really simple stuff, like uh, that anxiety is totally normal, that anxiety is not dangerous. And this is a way that someone described it to me quite recently. And I never thought about it like this because I think it's extremely reassuring sometimes because I think as you described at the beginning of our talk, anxiety can be really uncomfortable uh, and unpleasant, but it's not dangerous. And I think the main thing being that anxiety is manageable. And I really wish uh, till even I would say five to eight years, five years ago, it wasn't really that cool to talk about how you were feeling. It wasn't cool to talk about mental health or, or any kind of help seeking. And there weren't as, I mean, even a fraction of as many options as there are uh, now. <clears throat> but I think I would say, you know, that it, it is very important to talk about it, that there is a range of different kinds of options available and support available. And that at a really, you know, basic level, talk to your friends, your colleagues, your family, the people in your circle around you who can support you. And something that's helped me is mentorship. If you have the, the opportunities, you know, find somebody older, wiser that you trust and look up to. Uh, it's always helpful to have, uh, you know, someone else giving you a bit of a nudge in the right direction sometimes. 
And I think if you have the luxury and the privilege of choosing your job and choosing your career, uh, mm-hmm. you must ask yourself regularly, you know, why am I doing what I'm doing? Uh, is it still aligned with, you know, these goals I had for, for where I wanted to be and where I wanted to go five years ago, two years ago? Is it still aligned with where I wanted to go five years from now, for example? I mean, again, sorry, it's like um, not to push the five years ahead question. And finally, I think, again, I would reiterate, you are not your work. So it's very, very important to cultivate yourself also as a whole person. So beyond your work, even if it's a couple of things that you like to do or, or exploring, you know, other parts of yourself, whether it's through a hobby or through exercise or through just ways that help you to recharge. It's very, very important, I think, to do those things so that you can have a more sort of balanced approach to to your work and also, you know, manage these difficult things like like anxiety or the imposter syndrome. Uh, the second question, which was on emotions, and, and I really, I mean, honestly love this question in some ways because uh, we get this a lot and we've sort of finally, I think, devised a simpler way of answering this, which is uh, some a young person at one of our uh, workshops recently said this phrase, um, which is that emotions are really useful. And I thought that that's a really nice way to explain, um, explain this to someone else, which is also, again, to reiterate, you know, we are all human. We all have a range of emotions and these change from moment to moment, uh, week to week. Uh, it's simply, you know, part of being human. Uh, and it's very normal to feel anxious. As I said, it's normal to feel sad if you lose something, to feel angry and so on. But a lot of the time, the sort of overarching narrative in the world around us is that you must be happy. Uh, and happiness should be the state uh, of, you know, success. And if you're not happy, then, you know, something's wrong with you or somehow you're not succeeding, somehow you're not failing. Oh, sorry, you are failing. So I think a more helpful approach to this is, you know, uh, again, not to get into loads of details on this uh, and we can send across more information, but there's really simple ways of practicing making room within yourself for uh, accepting a range of all these feelings and emotions uh, especially painful ones, especially uh, those related to struggle. And uh, learning that process, accepting those emotions can help break that cycle. It can help to make you more free. Um, so, yeah, I think those would be a few things. And, and really simple stuff like it's easy to say be kind to yourself and be kind to others. But it's very hard to practice, uh, especially in a fast-paced world. Like a lot of the time you don't have time to really you know, be aware of what someone else is thinking or feeling. Um, so I think for me and also as a woman to other women, I would say like take that extra time to be kind and encourage someone else, encourage your colleague, lift someone up, especially in a moment when it's easy not to do that. Um, so yeah. And I mean, remind yourself of those things as often as you need to. So those would be things I think that are really useful. Thank you so much. I'm going to summarize some of the things that you all three of you have said it before I um, end with your, you know, there will be a last question after this Q&A from, from me, but I would love to summarize some of the stuff that you've said. Thank you for that. Pitnika, um, what did you have to change to fit in? What advice would you give a young woman who wants to be part of the industry? And then how do you suggest we teach young women not to see their space? to be more comfortable in their own skin? Okay, so the first question, what did I have to change? Nothing. I am just the way I am. I am in your face. I'm loud. I can be a bitch if I have to. That's who I am, you know? And uh, what advice would I give uh, to people, uh, to women who want to be a part of this industry is you don't have to change. You don't have to change to be a part of anything. You are perfect the way you are. And I think it's very important for you to kind of stick to who you are, stick to your beliefs. And my whole thing is that if you can look at yourself in the mirror and think you did an okay job, I think you're doing all right. You know, you don't, you don't need to, owe, you don't owe anybody anything, you know? So I would never tell anybody to change. Um, and the second question was, how do you suggest, uh, well, we teach young women not to see their space, right? It'd be more comfortable. I think we all as women, actually, we all as human beings need to do a lot of self-work. We need to do a lot of like, you know, and to understand who we really are, 
you know we don't actually spend time to understand who we are we're not our work we're not our, our family we're not what society tells us to be we need to know who we are you know we really need to kind of um, be comfortable in our own skin and that starts with self love you know if you can love yourself if you can you know if you think you're worthy enough and that is something you work on the rest will follow you know so you don't need to worry about how you know the other people because i know when i am comfortable in my skin and when i feel worthy and when i feel loved you know by myself i don't really care about what other people think you know i don't care about all of that so i think a lot of that is just first step is to work on self you know and the other thing would be obviously to speak to other people you know to have that support structure because i mean i start i do good vibrations which is a music industry sharing circle once a month and it's just we just talk and you know we just talk about whatever we can talk you know and it's just a good way to kind of you know you'll you'll understand what i'm facing even you're facing and it doesn't matter if you're a guy or a girl half the time it's the same problems you know so it's just sharing and talking also makes a big difference so we still have think about this Thank you very much. I'm going to and the last question was actually about what is the one piece of advice you would like to give the audience but if you see from what you all three of you have shared the last thing that you all shared was the last piece of advice unless there is any last thoughts so this was about you know the last thing that you've picked up on you know that that would make it better for people to be in a working environment and for the mental health of themselves and the people that they work with because i think all three of you sort of did share that in the end you know that one the one or two things that really are important um if there is any last thoughts from anyone please share them now so that i can wrap up i'll just like to add on just one thing and this is something that i always go to when i am facing with a situation when i'm feeling low i believe in the power of gratitude i believe that if you can just make a gratitude journal or just even talk to yourself and just list out things that you're grateful for that are going well in your life they really help you kind of cope through the tough times so i think that is just something that anybody can do and it really changes you know your mood yeah so there was so from your side and there's like the there's that sense of um keep a check on yourself of continue to look at who you are and um try not to negotiate on the things that are most valuable to you as you go through this process and and gratitude definitely because you want to know what is it that you're receiving from other people and i think um working back with patty you also was speaking about as you said like it sounds you know a uh, very simple to say but it's really complex to that we just all need to be really working on uh, our emotional health and 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 on our mental health and understanding emotional awareness and understanding the relationship that we have with feelings um so that so that we don't repeat these cycles because i firmly believe that regardless of what it is is that unless we address it we are doomed to repeat it it's it's the nature of it mm-hmm. and i think that that's i think what keep what could be the balancing act and i think the negotiation act is that you work on your strengths you keep building on your strengths you pull other people up but you also know your limitations and you call yourself out on those limitations and you give space for other people to mold into what you bring into the world and you allow them to do the same so that you don't have the people logger heading about wanting to do everything whilst feeling that they can't and i think that's a really powerful statement too shelly any last thoughts So I think um what I what I've been saying in one sense through um through this session and I think what Ritnika also said somewhere um while for me it's like I am coming to terms with my vulnerabilities and trying to basically see what I can juggle what I can't and I think um for me gratitude comes in the way it, the way it comes for me is that I I'm trying to be more forgiving to myself which is something that i haven't really done for a very long time so i think um, to just find those little recesses in your in your in, in your mind or just find ways to uh, you know give yourself a pat in the back i mean there are times when i just recognize it i feel that okay this is done for me a milestone is a tick box 
And I think it's true for a lot of women. They don't find a moment to celebrate that they were waiting for this to happen all this while and now that it has, you know, just give yourself a moment, you know, to, to uh, wallow in it, to enjoy it, uh, no matter how small, how irrelevant, but it was a milestone for you, right? So I think I'm trying to do that a bit and see if uh, that also makes me slightly more wholesome as a human being. And that possibly has a few tick boxes on finding that list of gratitude, you know, roof above the head, that sort of exercise, I think has definitely been so and honest to God, I mean, a lockdown has possibly given me even more reasons to explore that aspect. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna stop now. Um, I'm taking a lot away from this. It obvious, I'm sure all of you also share the feeling that this needs to be carried forward in the ways that we can actually support people. And uh, the conversation is the beginning and then it's about how we can take this forward. But I really want to thank all three of you um, for bringing in your own perspectives and being so wholesome in what it is that you have shared. Um, I want to thank everyone that is tuned in. I'm not used to this. I'm usually have all of you in front of me. So, um, and I don't, but I'm, I'm really glad that you're here. Thank you to the American Center for organizing this. Thank you for being in labor. And of course, a thank you to Wild City for bringing us all together.